Welcome to lecture one on foreign policy. When we think about foreign policy, the question to consider is what kind of foreign policy role do you think the United States should play in the future? Since the role of the military in foreign policy looms very large today, should the United States act as the world's policeman? Should we operate independently? Or should we operate merely under the auspices of the United Nations? Our interventions that we've been in, are they essential for protecting the United States? If not, what reasons do we have for such interventions? What about the ethical problems that underlie war? When is war permissible? If you look at ju the just war theory called Justin Bellow, it requires that there must be a just cause, such as self-defense, protection of the innocent from unjust attack, or the restoration of a just order. How do America's war, wars and interventions fit into this just war theory? These are some of the things you think about as we go through and we talk about foreign policy uh, from the American context. Foreign policy refers to the programs and policies that determine America's relations with other nations and other foreign entities. American foreign policy arenas include diplomacy, military and security policy, international human rights policies, and economic policies. Three main goals of UN's foreign policy are security, economic prosperity, and last but not least, human rights. How we view the world and other world actors ultimately determines how we seek to further our foreign policy goals. Now, in the study of international relations, there are three main theories that exist. The first is called realism. Realism is defined <coughs> excuse me, by the following assumptions. The international realm is anarchic and consists of independent political units called states. States are the primary actors and inherently possess offensive military capability or power which makes them potentially dangerous to each other. States can never be sure about the intentions of other states. The basic motive driving states is survival or the maintenance of sovereignty. So in other words, under realism, you can't depend on anybody else. Above the state, there is no higher power each state can do what it will. Now, this is in odds, it's at odds with what is called liberalism. Now, liberalism is a little bit different than the political ideology. In liberalism, it is believed that states are but one actor in world politics and they can cooperate together through institutional mechanisms and bargaining that ultimately undermine the system of anarchy. States are interdependent and other actors such as transnational corporations, the International Monetary Fund, and the United Nations play a significant role. So the key tenet to liberalism is, is they recognize the existence of anarchy above the state, but they believe that all of these international institutions help mitigate the effects of anarchy. And the last main uh, international relations theory that we're going to talk about is constructivism. Now, this was put forth by uh, Alexander Wynne, and he basically said that anarchy is what states make of it. That is, anarchy is a condition of the system of states because states in some system choose to make it so. Anarchy is a result of a process that constructs the rules or norms that govern the interaction of states. Constructivist theory holds that it is possible to change the anarchic nature of the system of states. Now, Wendt contends that the self is only defined through interactions with the other, and it is how each perceives one another that determine the meaning of anarchy that exists between them. So in other words, if we basically view another state as an enemy, then anarchy will z exist above the state in our relations with that state. I know that sounds kind of confusing, but, you know, it is what it is. Taken separately, 
None of these theories explain all of international relations, yet parts of each theory still hold true to this day. So, the three main goals to reiterate a foreign American foreign policy are security, economic prosperity, and human rights, with security actually being the main focus. Many Americans believe that the chief goal of foreign policy is security. Traditionally, the United States has been concerned with dangers that are posed by hostile foreign nations, but lately, we also um, are looking at threats that are posed by terrorist groups and other hostile non-state actors. A non-state actor is simply a group other than nation states that attempt to play a role in the international system. Now let's look at the early United States foreign policy. During the 18th and 19th centuries, U.S. security was guided by the principle of isolationism. Isolationism is the avoidance of involvement in the affairs of other nations. Presidents during their nation's early history, including George Washington and James Monroe, advocated for this policy. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and other experiences of World War II called into question whether isolationism best served security. Um, an author, Mearsheimer, argued that the presence of oceans in the world prevents any state from reaching what's known as world hegemony. He basically argues that large bodies of water limit the power projection abilities of militaries and thus naturally divide up the globe into spears of power. In other words, uh, during America's earlier period, 18th, 19th century, we had two great oceans that basically allowed America to pursue its isolationism foreign policy. You had the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. There were no countries at the time that could basically cross those oceans and threaten us militarily. Uh, I mean, the greatest navy in the world was owned by the British Empire, and they still did not have the wherewithal to invade the United States after World War, after uh, I think it was the War of 1812. So water has a, essentially a stopping power and a projection of power. And that's what, I mean, after Pearl Harbor, it basically, a lot of thinkers were looking at, you know, this and basically concluded that we can no longer depend on the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean to basically be our wall. Now, foreign policy after World War II. The, basically, World War II ended isolationism and ushered in a new security policy known as containment. Containment is a policy designed to curtail the political and military expansion of a hostile power. It was developed after World War II to check the growing power of the Soviet Union. The United States built a strong military to deter possible Soviet aggression against the nation and its allies. At the Yalta Conference, Stalin pledged to declare war on Japan three months after the German surrender. In exchange, Roosevelt and Churchill essentially agreed to the Soviet military occupation of Eastern Europe. Now, despite promised democratic elections, by 1949, the Soviets had set up one-party communist states mirroring their own in Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria and the Baltic states the Red Army had conquered in 1939 to 1940, while Hitler was attacking France, was also remained part of the Soviet Union. In addition to containment, two other schools of thought existed. The first was preventive war, or preemption. This is a policy of striking first when a nation fears that a foreign foe is contemplating a hostile action. Appeasement is the effort to forestall, forestall war by giving in to the demands of a hostile power. The policies that the United States actually adopted, deterrence and containment, can be seen as midway between these two schools of thought. Now, deterrence is an effort to prevent hostile action by promising to retaliate forcefully against any attacker. The policy of deterrence makes two fundamental assumptions. 
One is certainty. A potential adversary must know for certain that the United States will respond with force if attacked. The second is rationality. A potential adversary must be capable of rationally assessing the risk and cost of aggression against the United States. The era of U.S. confrontation with the Soviet Union is known as the Cold War. The United States and the Soviet Union each had a nuclear arsenal capable of destroying the world many times over. The result was a standoff, and this standoff was known as Mutually Assured Destruction, or MAD. To demonstrate the nation's commitment to containment in this, of the Soviet Union, the United States government engaged in wars in Korea and Vietnam. The fear was that if we didn't try to contain the Soviet Union, the Soviets would pursue an expansion policies around the world. The head of the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, George Keenan, sent a message that became known as the Long Telegram to the State Department. Keenan argued that Russian imperialism had not ended with the Russian Empire, and under the Soviets would advance under what he called the new guise of international Marxism. Although the USSR was being ruled not as a communist de democracy, but as a totalitarian dictatorship under Joseph Stalin. Marx's idea of a dictatorship of the proletariat, where workers would live together in such harmony that police and armies would be unnecessary, never arrived for the Russian people. We're going to pause there on lecture one.